Hi everyone, my name is Robin Gray and today Peyton and I are going to be discussing the environmental disaster that is known as the Love Canal. Today we will dive into the major events starting with the history of the Love Canal, environmental and human impacts, the aftermath of the disaster, and the long-term effects. I want to start off where Love Canal got its name from, a man named William T. Love. Love was an entrepreneur and developer in Niagara Falls, New York in the early 1890s. He saw the Niagara's rushing waters and abundant land resources and thought it would be a perfect foundation for an urban industrial empire. Love called it a model city or a perfect city that would dominate the region from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. He believed that this model city would thrive socially and economically because of its proximity to renewable water resources, which would generate cheap hydroelectric power from the electrochemical industry. The model city he envisioned promised all homes and businesses with electricity, telephone, gas, and sewer services. However, this American dream of a perfect city soon turned into an environmental disaster by the 1970s. In 1894, the construction of Love Canal began with Love's company excavating the Seven Mile River. Initially, Love sold his idea of the model city to many investors in order to fund the canal in the future in the city's future infrastructure. However, major problems began to occur as investors wanted assurance on their investments and not just Love's promise of a future in return. By 1910, the construction site for Love Canal was abandoned due to lack of funding and the fact that the investor Nikola Tesla came up with the alternating current electricity, which would travel farther than wire than direct current. and there wouldn't be a need for factories to locate near the Niagara Falls. This caused Love to leave behind the canal, which was now a half mile long swimming hole. However, in 1943, Elon Hooker decided to locate his electrochemical company near the canal, and the business eventually became the largest industrial enterprise in town making chemicals and plastics. The Hooker Chemical Company bought the Love Canal site and decided to use Love's Canal for waste disposal. As the canal was sparsely populated and the soil was largely composed of impermeable clay, Hooker's engineers thought it would contain the chemicals well. So from about 1942 to 1953, Hooker disposed of thousands of tons of chemical waste, some of it loose and some of it in metal drums. And it's important to note that the chemical was not, or the canal was not designed to be a sage or proper landfill. In 1953, Hooker sold the canal to the Niagara Falls School Board for one dollar, with the warning slash disclaimer that the site contained chemicals that should not be disturbed by digging, and included to avoid any future liabilities. However, it was agreed that a school with no basement and a playground would be acceptable. The site was supposed to be covered with several feet of clay to contain the chemicals, but later testing found only a few inches of soil covering metal drums in some areas. The late 1950s, there were a hundred residential homes, a school built on the property. In 1974, unknown chemicals resurfaced in the community's neighborhoods, ultimately affecting the environment and human life. This drove local newspapers and the Environmental Protection Agency to investigate and report the issue. They even did door-to-door -door health surveys within the community, community to conduct lists of series of illnesses. But the major question is, how did this happen? We see that in 1976 and 1977, there was an unusually heavy snow and rainfall that, has, that had raised the water table and flushed chemicals out of the canal. This caused chemical waste that was below ground to resurface and ultimately seep into people's basements, yards, and ponds. People's homes were also filled with noxious fumes. Here is a schematic illustration of the migration of contaminants from the dump site into the groundwater and streams that affected the environment and just people's lives. Moving on, in an article in 1978, by the EPA journal revealed that 82 different compounds, 11 of them suspected carcinogens, were percolating upward through the soil. Later, we found out that one quarter of the waste was benzene hexachloride, the main component of the pesticide lindane, a neurotoxin. There were chlorobenzenes, which was 
used in the synthesis DDT, and dozens of other organic chemicals, many of which were known to be toxic. Others included benzoic acid, chloroform, trichloroethylene, and chlorobenzene. A side note, during that time, scientists were just beginning to seriously study the effects of living in contaminated areas for long periods of time, so chronic low-dose exposure. Most previous studies had focused instead on the workplace exposure, where people were breathing and handling concentrated doses. As a result, the first health officials to begin talking to Love Canal residents had little specific information about health risks. Their advice to families who were seeing and smelling these chemicals in their basements were to stay out of the basement, just in case. Eventually, Love Canal made national news. In light of the public's awareness, the residents' activism and protests of the Love Canal tragedy gained national attention. They fought against denials of the health effects of the Love Canal from corporate, government, and scientific experts. You can see in the second photo here a young boy holding a sign that says, We've got better things to do than sit around and be contaminated. The photo on the right shows about 100 residents attending an emotional public meeting at the 99th Street School. There, state and local health officials openly disagree about the severity of the health risks posed by the chemicals, and the meeting dissolved into complete chaos. Frightened residents couldn't sell their homes, and they couldn't afford to abandon them. So while residents were stuck living in this unbelievable situation, it not only impacted their lives, but the environment itself. We see that water pollution occurred due to the chemical runoffs to local streams and rivers. This contaminated the groundwater and soil, which ultimately affected people's personal gardens, the trees, and plant life, all within this area. You can see in this photo a pool of chemical waste gathering in someone's backyard. In this photo, it shows workers packing thousands of water, soil, and air samples from the Love Canal area to be shipped to labs by the EPA. Not only was the environment impacted, but the impact on human life was unbelievable. And now Payton will discuss the impact on human life, responsibility over the Love Canal, and the long-term effects. Okay, so now on to the impacts on human life. The chemicals that were now invading homes in Love Canal began having awful side effects on the people who lived there. The women were having trouble carrying pregnancies to full term, often resulting in miscarriage. In fact, the relative odds ratio for the miscarriages for the women who lived in Love Canal at that time was 1.49. This means that the miscarriage birth rate was almost one and a half times the expected miscarriage rate for the general population. The children who were able to make it to full time often had many birth defects, such as cleft palate, deformed ears and teeth, hearing defects, mental retardation, heart defects, renal pelvis abnormalities, and club fit. Of course, there were many more. These are just a few of the examples. Um, it wasn't only the new children, though, that were having issues. Uh, the adults and children who had previously lived in Love Canal for a while began having a lot of health issues and even chronic illnesses such as nephrosis, uh, migraines, epilepsy, and asthma. Unfortunately, all of these problems were due to the exposure of the chemicals and carcinogens beneath the soil in Love Canal. Benzene, which many of you have probably heard of or even used in organic chemistry lab, was found in the soil and is known to cause uh, or to have acute effects such as narcosis and irritation to the skin, but also has chronic effects such as acute and chronic lymphatic leukemia, aplastic anemia, and even pancytopenia, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, so benzene was actually found in at least 23 of the houses in Love Canal. This is just an example of the side effects of one of the 82 chemicals that were identified. Again, while many of the inhabitants of Love Canal desperately wanted to vacate the area, it was still their home. Everything that they owned was there. It wasn't like they could just pack up and leave immediately. Okay, so who is responsible for the cleanup? Because Hooker Chemical Company sold Love Canal to the city of Niagara Falls, 
they were unable to be held responsible for the disaster in court. Therefore, the local government, the city of Niagara Falls, was responsible for the cleanup. They were also in charge of evacuating the residents, as well as establishing the Emergency Declaration Area, or the EDA. Okay, so more about the responsibility. The state government declared a state of emergency, which increased the state health commissioner's power to properly handle the disaster and aliquot funds to, toward the cleanup. The federal government then approved an emergency fund for the Love Canal disaster and eventually declared a federal evacuation order. The emergency fund, signed by President Carter, was actually the first emergency fund to be approved for a non-natural disaster. The cleanup of Love Canal began in late 1978 and didn't end until many decades later in 2004. It began by first evacuating the residents, which wasn't as simple as it sounds. Uh, the evacuation process brought up a lot of arguments between the residents of Love Canal and the government on whether the evacuation was going to be temporary or permanent. The government placed an emergency evacuation plan in place uh, just in case there was an explosion because of all the chemicals. Um, they performed a drill um, with the use of school buses, and while they were doing the drill, it actually failed, which then caused a rise in worry for a lot of the residents. Um, during the cleanup process, Love Canal was divided into seven different rings. Um, the innermost ring contained the houses that were closest to the canal and had the most contamination from the chemicals. The furthest ring um, contained the least amount of chemical contaminations and so forth. Okay, so a seven-stage remedial procedure was put in place for the cleanup process. Um, the initial actions, which was step one, included the collection of leachate from the site, um, the EPA building a fence around the canal, and environmental studies being conducted. Step two was landfill containment, where the EPA constructed a barrier drain and a leachate collection system. Then they covered the temporary clay cap with a synthetic material to prevent rain from getting to the buried waste. The EPA demolished the houses closest to the landfill and conducted studies to help find the best way to clean up Love Canal. The third step was sewers, creeks, and berms, um, where the APA I'm sorry, the EPA implemented a remedy to remediate the sewers and creeks. Fourth step was thermal treatment of sewers and creek sediments, which was where the EPA created a plan to address the destruction and disposal of contained, I'm sorry, contaminated sediments in both the sewers and the creeks. The fifth step, which is the, remedi the remediation of 93rd Street schools, was the evacuation of about 7,500 cubic yards worth of contaminated soil by the school. After the removal of an on-site solidification uh, of the sediments was done, the sixth step then began. Um, which was home maintenance. Uh, it involved the purchase of the contaminated properties by both the state of New York and the federal government. The last step, property ap acquisition, involved the EPA providing $2.5 million for the purchasing of the properties that were not eligible to be purchased from the Federal Emergency Management Agency grant, which was from the previous step, of the repurchase of the homes. This slide shows a figure representation of what the plan was for the construction to fix Love Canal. You can see that they proposed a clay cap to cover the existing canal and dig a trench with a drain pipe to flow the pollutants away from the basements of people's homes. Okay, now on to long-term effects. So, Love Canal was eventually declared a Superfund site, which is an area that is toxically polluted. The effects of the toxic chemicals that were dumped into Love Canal still persist today. In fact, in 2011, a sewer line project started to discharge a bunch of contaminated sediments that contained the chemical chlorobenzene. Love Canal is still quarantined today. The human long-term 
effects for the children that were born in Love Canal was mostly birth defects. Majority of them were born with them and also struggle with many different health issues. Some children were born without birth defects, but also have many health issues. Um, Most of the adults and younger children of Love Canal have chronic illnesses such as cancer and epilepsy. One woman, Dolly Salerno, moved to Love Canal in 1994 during the cleanup. Her family lived in a house that was in a quote-unquote safe area of Love Canal. She eventually started getting dizzy and having shortness of breath all the time. In 2018, she did an interview and told the interviewer that she has now developed migraines, pulmonary fibrosis, and a lung disease. While the area of her home was deemed safe by the county health department's air tests, a private company performed soil and dust tests and actually found traces of chemicals such as dioxins, PCBs, and chlorinated pesticides near her home. This is an example of one woman from one house in the quote-unquote safe part of Love Canal. This slide has a photo um, showing the before and after of Love Canal. The left photo was taken in 1980, and the right is what it looks like today. Even though Love Canal was a terrible environmental disaster, it was unfortunately a learning experience for everyone. This is why we have rules, regulations, guidelines, and procedures to follow when dealing with toxicants in hopes to never have this type of incident repeated in the future. We finally made it to the end. Um, Here are our references. Uh, Thank you for listening to us today. We hope you learned something. Um, If there's any questions, we'll be happy to answer them at this time. Thanks.